Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. On the day we were born, we were doomed to die. We live on each breath and look up at the sky. Our breath is not ours, it's only our loan. For those who obey, they'll kneel at his throne. We're going to talk about death today and the signposts that we have to warn us of it. And the real thing that we have to avoid is the second death. And we're going to find out about the second death, which is the, the real permanent one. The first one is, of course, required. But the second one is not required. Signposts, like people, are set up. Prophets, evangelists, teachers, they're the signposts that keep you away from the second death. Today's terminology we're going to use today is on this screen. I'm just going to briefly show it to you. Those uh, that watching this on DVD or YouTube can slow it down and read it. But every little term here is going to explain what we're going to use in the seminar so everybody will understand. The real name of the creator, Yahuwah, spelled yod Hey uah Hey, is going to be used, not this device that was added by translators. And we're going to call the Messiah Yahusha or Yahushua. Both are perfectly fine. And we're not going to use the word, uh, any Greek at all. We don't need the Greek. We can go right straight back to the Hebrew. And we're not going to use the word G-O-D. We're going to call him Elohim, which means mighty one. And the Yahudim are one tribe of technically 13 tribes, or 12 tribes if you count Yosef as one tribe. Now, Yisrael, we're not here to replace Yisrael. We're here to enjoin, engraft, or restore to Yisrael through the covenant. And the Nazarim, who we call ourselves from the evidence at Acts 24, verse 5, that's what we're called because Shaul, or Paul, was called the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarim. We don't need to be called by a Greek term. But in fact, we are Nazarim, which means branches, which means the descendants of teachings of Yahuwah. And uh, it also means guardians or watchmen. So we're guarding two things primarily. We're guarding the name of the Creator, and we're guarding the covenant or Torah, which means instruction, instruction. And that's what we're going to start with after we go into uh, the next screen. The Messiah, Yahusha, is the root, and we are the branches of his teachings. And we guard the name and the Torah. Now, by teaching Torah, that's the instructions of Yahuwah, which is his character, we're teaching love. That's what it is. A man of importance once asked Yahusha this question, what shall I do to have everlasting life? He wasn't asking him, how can I acquire more stuff? He was asking him about the most important question, how can I avoid the second death? In Matthew 19, verse 16. And in Proverbs 18, we hear the word death used, which is you know a Hebrew word, muth, the, the, the Hebrew word muth gives us the idea of the cessation of life. It's, it's death. And the Greek term and the Latin terms are not that important. But the Latin, of course, would be morte, which we get the word mortal from. So we're mortal because we are able to be killed. And the Greek term for death is thanatos, I believe it is. Thanatos. Now, in, in the Proverbs 18, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, 
and those loving it eat its fruit. Uh, in other words, if we speak life, we're speaking the Torah. And if we speak death, we're speaking against the Torah. In Proverbs 6, it says, for the command, or the mitzvah, is a lamp, and the Torah, a light, and reproofs of discipline, a way of life. The character of Yahuwah is in his commandments. Now, here is the retelling of the covenant, and it's, it's actually for the scattered tribes of Israel in the last days, and it's given at Deuteronomy 5. Number one is, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage, you have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Now the fourth commandment, I want to see if you can find a, an important word that pops out of here. We're to, in the Re book of Revelation, it says that we are to worship him who created the heavens and the earth and the, and, and the things in the earth. Now, guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do, and you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And that's a covenant sign at Ezekiel chapter 20. Number five is respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, so that your days are prolonged, and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim has given you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. When I was trained as a Catholic in my younger years, I didn't have these commandments in this order because they eliminated the second one and they, you know, the bowing of idol, to out idols. And they just wiped it out. So the third commandment for me was the one about the Sabbath day. And they made the tenth one into two in order to retain ten. Now hear, O Yisrael, Shema, that means to hear and obey. Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children, and you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We're going to show pictures of that very thing happening. Of course, we need to write them so we can read them, really. Now, this seminar is about death. And we're going to find out about the messengers that are going to be sent out in the last day. And there's going to be massive death, okay, on the earth. That's, people are going to be destroyed that are alive. They're going to be watching. They're going to be marrying and ha blowing out candles on birthday cakes. And they're going to be putting up trees in their homes and putting ornaments on them and wondering why is it happening to them. Messengers are the birds of prey. You see, we're, we're, we, we hear in the scriptures about birds of tray, prey eating the flesh of the deceased. The messengers are going to be sent out. They're, right now, they're, they're waiting to pounce, even now. And when they're given the release, 
on a given day, they're going to swoop across this earth and they're going to destroy flesh like you would not believe. And they're not going to be real birds. They're going to be messengers, malachim, what they call angels. Now, but death is the last enemy and it will be swallowed up because it's going to be thrown into the lake of fire because the lake of fire is the second death. Now, here's a question, a little fun to lighten up. What does life after death and extraterrestrial life and global warming all have in common? Well, one answer would be no one can seem to find out anything about them. If you, <laughs> if you study death on any level for 30 minutes or 30 years, there's very little difference in actual data that you can prove. So anyway, down here on the bottom, we see people trying to contact the dead. But the dead have no knowledge of anything that's going on under the sun. And here's a fellow says, joke's over, let me out now. And of course, there's a dead pharaoh or some kind of Egyptian. Now, the Egyptians, when they buried people in their tombs, they had all sorts of food there and boats, chairs, you know, and all this stuff, you know, gems and coins and gold. But uh, when they bust into the tombs, they, they find out that nobody ever sat in the chairs. Nobody ever rode in the boats. You know, the dude's still sitting there in his tomb, you know. We all do share this common enemy, death. We're all going to be faced with it. Right here in this room, in the last year, year and a half, there's been at least two or three people that, will, that have been in attendance here that are no longer with the living. And they, it takes young and old. One was in his early teen years, and one was much, much older. People that, uh, you know, they just get sick or they have accidents, you know. And uh, every one of us are going to face this alone. But we will have one person with us, and that's the Messiah, who we invite to speak in our presence, and hopefully his words in the text will come through. Money, power, or technology can't deliver anyone from this death. But there is only one way of deliverance. Only one. It's intolerant of any other method. And we'll discuss this in this seminar. There's one way. Every second of every day, everyone and everywhere, people are unexpectedly breathing their last breath of life. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read this. The last enemy... To be brought to naught is death. And unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We're not talking about the first death. Everybody's going to have to face that. But there's nothing to fear from that if you're, if you're saved from the second one. Walt Disney didn't have enough money or technology to stop it. Death originated through one thing, and that's rebellion against Yahuwah's instructions, which is his Torah. The subject of death is common to all mankind, and these pictures and movies that we, read, that we see and read about, like Dracula, he's the, the original one's right here, just a painting though, and Frankenstein's monster, and the wolfman and the mummy, they're all characters that embody our deepest horrors about death. They, they give form and shape to our, to our fear of death. So the greatest enigma is still death, and it always will be. Nobody, nobody has uh, died and then come back to life to explain it to us. Because even those that we know that were resurrected by Yahusha or others didn't know any more than if they woke up from a dream. They didn't really experience anything to really tell us anything. Otherwise, that we would have had a, a lengthy ex explanation from Eleazar, the one they call Lazarus. And he was alive for quite a while. Many of us believe that he's still among us as you'll see in one of these texts. Now, an example of a visual allegory of death is the image of the grim reaper. Now, the reapers are the messengers that are waiting that we talked about earlier. These are the birds of prey. They're going to devour the flesh of many, many people. If you read Ezekiel chapter 39, you're going to hear and read about a great harvest feast. You know, it's a harvest, but it's also a feast. And the flesh of great men, leaders, are going to be consumed by these birds of prey.
The image of the Grim Reaper is a symbolic representation of death. And uh, the wisest man that we know of, other than Yahushua himself, is uh, writing these words in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. There is one event to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are filled with evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and then they die. But for him who is joined to all the living, there is trust. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, nor do they have any more reward, for their remembrance is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy have now perished, and they no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. And Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 says, All that your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Now, the messengers that we spoke of earlier are bound, and they're waiting. Revelation 9 tells us about them, starting at verse 13. And the sixth messenger sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before Elohim, saying to the sixth messenger who had the trumpet, release the four messengers, those having been bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four messengers those having been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Revelation 14, further along, says, And the messenger thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of Elohim. So these four messengers are depicted as colored horses, with riders and the weapons that they hold. We have one that's conquest, one that's war, one that's famine, and one that's death. The first four of the seven seals in Revelation chapter 6. The first seal is a white horse, its rider holds a bow. And the second seal is a red horse, its rider holds a sword. And the third seal, a black horse, its rider holds a pair of scales. And the fourth seal is a pale horse or a green horse. Chloros is the Greek word. Its rider is called death. And Revelation 6 says, And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked and saw a pale or green, green horse. And he who sat on it had the name death. And the grave followed with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and by the beasts of the earth. So we have uh, a lot of things that can kill us because we're mortal, you know, we're morte. We can, we can easily die of, vid of very many things. Old age, accidents, child sacrifices, abortions, wars, diseases, bio-warfare, eugenics, nuclear radiation, chemical pollution, famine, wild beasts, and then the reapers themselves, which are the birds of prey. Now, the reapers, surprise. Hi there. This is a, kind of gonna be a big surprise for people when they see it coming. They're gonna be released on the day of wrath. Matthew 13 describes it. Yahushua says, then having sent the crowds away, Yahushua went into the house, and his taught ones came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the Darnell of the field. And he answering said to them, he's going to interpret what these symbols mean. He who is sowing the good seed is the son of Adam. That's him. Yahushua is the son of Adam. And the field is the world. And the good seed, these are the sons of the rain. And the daughters, of course. But the Darnell are the sons of the wicked one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the messengers. And the Darnell then is gathered and burned in the fire. Now that's the first thing that happens. The first thing that happens is the Darnell is gathered, not the wheat. Okay? So it shall be at the end of this age. The son of Adam shall send out his messengers. 
And they shall gather out of his reign all the stumbling blocks and those doing lawlessness, and shall throw them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the reign of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So in other words, they're going to be transformed then, afterwards. They'll be protected because they're sealed. But then they're going to be shining, you know. <clears throat> now, the determination of which one we are going to be is who we're living for. Who we live for determines the final outcome. Matthew 16 says, For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. You're living either for yourself or you're living for him. For what is a man profited if he gains all the world and loses his own life? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his life? For the son of Adam is going to come in the esteem of his father with his messengers. And then he shall reward each according to his works. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death at all until they see the son of Adam coming in his reign. So the choice is to gain the world, you know, and work and try to acquire the world or to serve Yahuwah. And he will equip you to do the work that he sends you forth to do. So if you gain Yahushua, you're going to find life. The way is the living word. He's the living word. He's the living Torah. In John, in John or Yahuchan, in chapter 14, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in Elohim. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many staying places. And if not, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I shall come, and come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you might be too. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. But Thomas, or Toma, said to him, Master, we, don't, we do not know where you are going. And how are we able to know the way? Yahuwah said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now that's intolerant of any other way. And the conclusion is that all other ways are the ways of death. <clears throat> so the United Religions Initiative is not the way. Now, you can compare these things, the way of death and the way of righteousness. Proverbs 14 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And Proverbs 12 says, In the way of righteousness is life, and it, in its pathway there is no death. Torah is metaphorically a woman called wisdom, or kokma in Hebrew, named wisdom. And it means great skill, you know, in, in its purest form. All other ways are a strange woman, so it's, it's all off. Proverbs 1 says, wisdom calls, out, calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the broad places. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out at the openings of the gates. That's where the Torah is supposed to be written. Remember this? So Torah is wisdom crying out at the gates. In the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, would you love simplicity? And shall scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Turn at my reproof. See, I pour out my spirit on you. I make my words known to you. So look at also uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. And here's a picture of a door up here that has a mezuzah, which means door frame or doorpost. It, it's a strange thing to call the Torah, but the door frame is what that you're saying when you say mezuzah. Anyway, the, the wisdom is the Torah crying out at the posts, okay? And that's why it's interesting, uh, you know, that the door is always referred to as Yahusha. He is the door for the, for the sheet, or the gate. Proverbs 8 says, And now listen to me, you children, for blessed are they who guard my ways. Listen to discipline and become wise and do not refuse it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoever finds me shall find life 
and obtain favor from Yahuwah. But he who sins against me injures himself. All who hate me love death. So if you hate the Torah, the instructions of Yahuwah, then you also would hate Yahusha because he brings that to you and writes it on your heart. That's the new covenant or the renewed covenant. Deception can be propelled by our own desires. Your desires produce death and corruption. And Yahusha's desires produce life eternal. In his half-brother's uh, writings in James or Yaakov chapter 1, it says, But each one is enticed when he is drawn away by his own desires and trapped. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. In 1 Yahukanen, or 1 John 2, it says, Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust of it. But the one doing the desire of Elohim remains forever. So if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap death. But if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap eternal life. So the treasure that you have to pursue is not worldly things. It's The treasure is Yahuwah's presence, his love, and, and, his, and his Torah, his, instru- his instructions. And those that, t- that have them share them with others. Now, Galatians 6 says, Do not be led astray. Elohim is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Because he who sows to his own flesh shall reap corruption from the flesh, but he who sows to the Spirit shall reap everlasting life from the Spirit. So when you have the Torah written on your hearts and you share it with other people, you're sowing that. That goes out into the world and it's going to be producing fruit. The remedy is deliverance. That's the thing that we have to, we have to be delivered from the second death. We're not going to be delivered from the first death unless it happens to be that Yahushua comes back while we're alive. But we will be facing the first death. The deliverance is from the second death, which is the lake of fire. Now, Hebrews 9, starting at 27, says, And it awaits men to die once, and after this, the judgment. So also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time, apart from from sin, to those waiting for him unto deliverance. We're waiting for him. You know, we're going to say, there he is. We have waited for you. Now, these people that are in this picture are just a sample of some of the people that you probably recognize. Christopher Reeve, Superman, you know, Hitler, Houdini, a recent dictator, two of the Beatles, and uh, Michael Jackson, and the, and the Pope, and Mother Teresa. And this fellow right here, George Carlin, he was challenging Yahuwah one day in a, when he was younger to strike him dead if he was there. Well, he's dead now. He, he doesn't, uh, you know, immediately act. Matthew 19, it says, And see, one came to him saying, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life? And he said to him, that's Yahushua speaking now, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. And he said to him, Which? And Yahushua said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, respect your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, All these I have watched over from my youth. What do I still lack? Yahushua said to him, because he saw into his heart, If you wish to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. And when the young man heard the word, He went away sad because he had many possessions. The desires of his heart were wrapped up in the treasure that he owned. Matthew chapter 19 says, And Yahushua said to his taught ones, Truly I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter into the reign of the heavens, but not impossible. Yisrael possesses this treasure. We're not replacing Yisrael, we're restoring people to Yisrael. 
And th by doing that, we do it with, through the covenant, the Torah. Uh, we read it at the very beginning, which is our treasure. And it, it teaches us how to love. Matthew or Matthew 6 says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. Proverbs 2 says, my son, if you accept my words and treasure up my commands with you, so that you make your ear attend to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding, for if you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you would understand the fear of Yahuwah and find the knowledge of Elohim. For Yahuwah gives wisdom, and out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Now here's three little verses, uh, no, four. And it's really interesting. Psalm 116 says, Precious in the eyes of Yahuwah is the death of his kind ones. Those mean the pious ones, the ones that have been loving him and obeying his commands. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, Now, brothers, we do not wish you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep. Lest you be sad as others who have no expectation. For if we believe that Yahushua died and rose again, so also Elohim shall bring with him those who sleep in Yahushua. And his brother James, or Jacob says in chapter 4, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, let us go and do such and such to such and such a city. Spend a year and trade and make a profit. And when you do, when you do not know of tomorrow, for what is your life? For it is a vapor that appears for a little and then disappears instead of your saying, if the master desires, we shall live and do this or that. So if the master desires, we shall live today and do this or that. And Proverbs 11 says, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The sting of death is shared by those who live only for themselves. Okay, if you live for yourself, you're going to feel the sting of death without concern for others. If you don't care about other people and you're only living for yourself. So the, the first death is the physical death of the body, but the second death is to perish in the lake of fire. We're going to look at a little bit at those ideas right now. The second death is described here in Revelation 2. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. See, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison in order to try you, and you shall have pressure ten days. Be trustworthy unto, until death, and I shall give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. He who overcomes shall by no means be harmed by the second death. So the outcome at the great white throne judgment is going to be one of two things. Either you're going to enter into the joy of your master or you're going to find yourself consigned to the lake of fire. Revelation 20 says, Blessed or happy and set apart is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death possesses no authority over these. But they shall be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the great white throne judgment happens at the end of the thousand years. So the first resurrection and the second resurrection, you want to aim for the first one. You know, that way you're not even going to be in the, you, you won't have to be determined by the scroll of life, but you'll be in the book of remembrance. You can read about that in Malachi. So those that are not found in the scroll of life have to wind up in, you know, eternal destruction. The lake of fire is the second death. And Revelation 20 describes it. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead, those who were in it, and, and death and the grave gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works, and the death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So the lake of fire is the second death. Revelation 21 says, but as for the cowardly and the untrustworthy and the abominable and murderers and those who whore and drug sorcerers and idolaters and all the false, their part is in the lake which burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And Matthew 22 says, then the sovereign said to the servants, now the servants, and this is Yahushua speaking, and he's talking about his messengers, the birds of prey, his angels of death. He said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and throw him into the outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the servants are the messengers, the Malachim, and the outer darkness is a term for the lake of fire. Imagine floating, just for a moment, just imagine floating in a starless, infinite darkness forever, alone, abandoned in isolated thought with no identity or frame of reference to anything at all. And a creature in this sort of misery would beg for annihilation. What? Oh, I put this stuff in here because it's, you know, kind of, well, it's true too. Socialism is fair and equal distribution of misery. But there's going to be a fair and equal distribution of misery for sure. And this is where it all started, basically, in these times. Now, a parable about the harvesting of the earth. Now, this is a parable from Yehusha. And Yehusha answering, he answering, said to him, He who is sowing the good seed is the son of Adam. And the field is the world, as we said earlier. And the good seed, these are the sons of the rain, but the darnel are the sons of the wicked one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the messengers, the birds of prey. As the darnel then is gathered and burned in the fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The son of Adam shall send out his messengers, and they shall gather out of his reign all the stumbling blocks and those doing lawlessness, and shall throw them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the, in the reign of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. We've done this twice, so you can see the picture. It's not going to be like the Christian rapture theory is explaining it. First Peter 4 says, And if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where shall the wicked and the sinner appear? They're going to be chased after by these guys. They won't be able to outrun them. Watch this. Now, what is the current condition of all those that have died? Everybody wants to know that. Okay, all we can go by is scripture. We can sit here and make a list of, of a million things that we can think of, make movies that make them look real. But this is the truth. Daniel 12, 13 gives us a small bit of data on that. But you, Daniel, go your way till the end and rest and arise to your lot at the end of the days. So in the end times, Daniel's just going to wake up not remembering how long time has passed. And in Acts 2, it says, for Daud, that's David, did not ascend into the heavens. Where is he? He's still sleeping. But he himself said, that's David or Daud, Yahuwah said to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. In Yahukanan or John chapter 11, it says, he said this, and after that he said to them, Our friend, they call him Lazarus, but his name is Eleazar, has fallen asleep. But I am going there to wake him up. Therefore the taught one said to him, Master, if he's fallen asleep, he shall recover. But Yahushua had spoken about his death, whereas they thought that he spoke of taking rest and sleep. So then Yahushua said to them plainly, Eleazar has died. The sleep of death requires Yahushua to awaken us. The brother of Miriam, now that's the one they, they, they call Lazarus, and Martha. Miri, Miriam and Martha were, and, and Eleazar were a family. And he was, he was awakened fr from death by Yahushua. 
John chapter 11 continues a little bit. We're going to look at that. Uh, Martha then said to Yahushua, Master, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you might ask of Elohim, Elohim shall give you. Yahushua said to her, Your brother shall rise again. She'd seen him perform resurrections before. Sick people, dead people, you know. Anyway, she's, she's implying, why don't you go ahead and uh, do this? But he's been in the tomb four days, you know. And Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Yahushua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. And everyone that is living and believing in me shall never die at all. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yea, Master, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of Elohim who is coming into the world. So her brother, Eleazar, his name actually means Elohim helps. Uh, he was, that was also a similar name to the Abraham serv servant, El Eliezer. He was raised from the dead because Yahushua said, Eleazar, come forth. He didn't have to say it twice. Anyway, before that happened, Yahushua's, uh, I want to point this out, the shortest verse in all of the scriptures that I've been able to find, the shortest verse, is Yahushua in our John chapter 11, verse 35. Yahushua wept. But you know what? I don't think he was just weeping because his, his beloved disciple had died, the, Tal, the, Talmud, the Talmud that he loved. He was dying, I mean, he was weeping for all of, the, all of us, you know, because he knew what we were facing and what he was going to face too. But uh, he was looking forward to the second death and he was seeing the tragedy there. That's why he's the greatest signpost of all. You know, he's drawing all men to him to look, look up and look at that, what was on that pole, you know, so that you might not die, you know, just as the serpent was lifted in the wilderness. In John chapter 11, it says, and he who died came out bound feet and hands with wrappings, and his face was wrapped with cloth. And Yahushua said to them, Loose him and let him go. Therefore many of the, of the Yahudim who had come to Miriam and had seen what Yahushua did believed in him. Now the writer of this in the book of Yahushua and John, he's actually writing about him his own resurrection. Now that's pretty unusual to be saying, but he doesn't ever name himself in the book except by a term, the disciple whom Yahushua loved. That's what he calls, the writer calls himself all the way through the book. And the only t person that that's actually referring to in this entire book, the only book that this is mentioned in, as a matter of fact, is his writings, is the one that Yahushua rose from the dead, raised from the dead. Now that's an interesting thing. Anyway, uh, the dead, their spirits are actually alive to him. Whether we're living or dead, if we're in him, he, we, we're, uh, we're still alive even though we're asleep, like Daniel or Daoud. Matthew 22 says, And concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what is spoken to you by Elohim, saying, I am the Elohim of Abraham, and the Elohim of Yishak, and the Elohim of Yaakov. Elohim is not the Elohim of the dead, but of the living. Death is to be swallowed up in life, so the solution is in receiving the water of life. Because, you know, without the water of life, we're dead in our sins. But you have to first, we're going to have to first look at some dry bones. You know, we've read Ezekiel chapter 37 enough, and we've seen these dry bones. It's talking about the Israelites that went, well, mostly all of Israel, but the dead bones that he's going to speak to in the last day to say, come out, come forth. So it relates to, La uh, to Eleazar's resurrection too. But there's a place for the dry bones of the dead that we call uh, ossuaries. You know, we put them in boxes or in some cases, entire buildings are dedicated as ossuaries. And there's one particular one in Sedlik Shek in the Czech Republic, which is a, Actually, it's uh, kind of ghastly. They've got all these bones in there. And the bones and the skulls and all have been stripped of their flesh, okay? And we're going to look at how that was done just a little bit. 
So the ossuary is from the Latin word, root os, which means Latin, it means bone in Latin. Os, ossuary is a bone box. And here's bones down here, the doctor from Star Trek. He's saying, uh, it's a bone house, Jim. They're all dead. <laughs> Those of you that are old enough know about that. Yeah. Anyway, there's photographs of these things. And there's many, many places where the ancients, uh, the Catholics have got a whole bunch of them down in the, in the, in the Vatican. So ossuaries are sometimes called bone boxes, but you know, they're actually uh, mimicking a granary. You know, they're, 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 for, they're actually depicted, a lot of people don't know this, but um, when the first century Yahudim started making little ossuary boxes for bones, they were depicting granaries because there was a verse here in, in uh, John chapter 12 where Yahushua speaks of a similarity between the dead, the seed, and the uh, resurrection. It says, and Yahushua answering them saying, the hour has come for the son of Adam to be esteemed. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In other words, when it's planted in the ground, then it starts to grow and it bears much fruit, more than just itself. In Genesis 50, this is about Yusuf or Yosef, and Yosef made the children of Israel swear. He was about 110 years old. And he says, Elohim shall certainly visit you, speaking probably of Yahushua, and, shall bring up, and, and you shall bring up my bones from here. And, you, and Yosef died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was placed in a coffin in Mizraim. And they did carry his bones back with them when they left in the exodus. In the Exodus. Now, how did they manage the remains? How did, when a person died, what did they do? In the Chalcolithic period, that's what they call it, and they call the, the people the Chalcolithic people, but this is b long before Israel received the covenant or went into the land. A thousand years before the Israelites went into the land from the Exodus. These people that we don't even know much about them. We don't even know what to name them. But they did this. They had these practices. And this is a, just a technical drawing of what they did. The outer walls were 30 feet high, roughly. And uh, the inner, there were like four walls. And each one succe successively was smaller and smaller and smaller. And birds of prey, vultures and eagles, which are vultures, would, pa would fill up these walls. And they would put a body down in the middle of this on a big stone. And the Chalcolithic people would uh, go in and they'd place this body in there. And there were probably birds standing all around waiting to get at it. And in an hour and a half, about, an, about 90 minutes, they would have picked every bit off of the bones. And that's the way they did it. And then they took the bones and they put them in a box. Some, somewhat that looked like a granary. You know, it looked like a little storage facility. It didn't look like a house so much as it did a granary. Now, the, uh, thing, it, the thing that's interesting here, th this place is called Rogum. Uh, actually, Rogum Hiri, which are Hebrew words. Rogum is a word that means a karn, which is, a, I guess, an old English word or whatever. It means a circle of stones. Anyway, they built this a thousand years before the exodus from Mitzrayim. And it was for the ritual exposure of bodies to vultures for what we call excarnation. Not incarnation, but excarnation. Anyway, the vultures would, would just sit on these things. And this thing was about 500 feet wide, you know, or even a little more, give or take. Anyway, this particular one that I'm going to show you a picture of the, of the ruins is located about 10 miles from uh, the northern edge on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. So you get the Sea of Galilee, and at the northern edge, about 10 miles over, is this, is this site. I'm going to show it to you. 
I'm giving credit for this research to Rami Arav. Uh, he's from, this was published, uh, you know, in the November, December 2011, BAR. So here's a picture of this site that they excarnated these bodies. And they estimate the size of the walls based on the foundations. And they, they realized that the vultures on the outer walls would have a clear view of the body that's laying there. So eaten by, uh, by birds is actually a dishonor to Israelites. But it was, they considered, these, these Chalcolithic people considered vultures in a different way than we do today, and certainly from Israel. They thought it was a special thing to be eaten by birds because that was like being, uh, that would, that, that's like being buried in the sky because the birds would eat you and then they'd carry you into the sky. How, how nuts is that? Anyway, here's what Yahuwah's point of view is this. He, Yahuwah sees that eaten by birds is a bad thing. Deuteronomy 28, starting at verse 25, says, Yahuwah causes you to be defeated before your enemies. He's talk, listing the curses here. You go one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become a horror to all the reins of the earth, and your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth, with no one to frighten them away. Now this, was what, this is one of my favorite verses. Spoken by, it was spoken to the giant Goliath, okay? In 1 Samuel 17. But Daoud said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of Yahuwah of armies, the Elohim of the armies of Yisrael, whom you have reproached. This day, Yahuwah shall deliver you into my hand, and I shall smite you and take your head from you and give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines today to the birds of the heavens and the wild beasts of the earth so that all the earth know that Elohim is for Yisrael and all this assembly know that Yahuwah does not save by sword or with sword and spear, for the battle belongs to Yahuwah and he shall give you into our hands. Wow. Ezekiel 37 talks about the uh, joining of the two houses, and this kind of relates too. The Hebrew word for eagle or vulture is nesher, and the Greek is elos, and the Latin is aquila, and the English word is eagle or vulture. It's interchangeable. It means the same thing. They're both members of the family, of Asipitridae, that's a biological term. Ezekiel 37, four says, again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and, and, and you shall say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of Yahuwah. Well, we know because we've been trained by the, what we know, what is the word of Yahuwah? Well, we read it at the beginning of the, of the, of the seminar. Son of man, would these bones live, you know? Uh, Ezekiel 37, 13 says, And you shall know that I am Yahuwah when I open your graves, O my people, and bring you up from your graves. And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall, set, and I shall settle you in your own land, and you shall know that I, Yahuwah, have spoken, and I have done it, declares Yahuwah. Now, Yahusha is a well. Uh, he's a lot of things, but this, this is really interesting. He's a well of living waters. And we remember the woman at the well, which was an emblem of the lost tribes in captivity. In John chapter 4, Yahushua answering and said to her, If you knew the gift of Elohim and who it is that says to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Master, you have no vessel, and the well is deep. From where then do you have living water? Are you greater than our father Yaakov who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Yahusha answered and said to her, everyone drinking of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I shall give him shall certainly never thirst. And the water that I shall give him or give him shall become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Now, men's religions cannot hold water because it's man-made. There's cisterns 
are cracked. You know, they're defective. Because, you know, reading Jeremiah 2 says, Has a nation changed its mighty ones, which are not mighty ones? But my people have changed my esteem for that which does not profit. Be amazed, O heavens, at this, and be frightened, and be utterly dried up, declares Yahuwah. For my people have done two evils. First, they eliminated his name, which is his identity. And second, they made up their own traditions instead of following his. To hew out for themselves cisterns, they've forsaken me. That's what it says. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. So Yahuwah is the fountain, the well of living waters. And they've done a second thing. They've hewn out for themselves cisterns. In other words, their own wells. And they're cracked cisterns which do not hold water. So they've, they deny his identity. That's his name, which is what we defend and guard as Nazarene. And they've made up their own rules to live by, which we guard is his Torah. That's really important to see. Now, who or what is living water? The answer is Yahuwah. He already told us. Now, in Jeremiah 17, he, in a little later, he says this. O Yahuwah, the expectation, expectation of Yisrael. All who forsake you are put to shame. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken Yahuwah, the fountain of living waters. Now, Yahusha is the deliverer that we are waiting for. In Yeshayahu, or Isaiah 25, he shall swallow up death forever. And the master Yahuwah shall wipe away tears from all faces and take away the reproach of his people from all the earth. For Yahuwah has spoken, and it shall be said in that day, See, this is our Elohim. We have waited for him, and he saves us. Who do you think that is? This is Yahuwah. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his deliverance. If you had known me, and he says in John 14, you would have known my father too. From now on, you know him and have seen him. People are coming to an understanding and the grumblers are receiving instruction. Now in Yeshayahu 29, it says, In that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of gloom and out of darkness. And the meek ones shall increase their joy in Yahuwah. And the poor among men rejoice in the set-apart one of Yisrael. For the ruthless one is brought to naught, the scorner is consumed, and all who watch for evil shall be cut off. Those who make a man to sin in a word and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate and turn away the righteous with empty reasoning. Now, therefore, thus said Yahuwah, who ransomed Abraham concerning the house of Yaakov, Yaakov is no longer put to shame, no longer does his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they shall set apart my name and set apart this the set apart one of Yaakov, and fear the Elohim of Israel. Those who went astray in spirit shall come to understanding, and the grumblers will accept instruction. We of the covenant call to those who sit in darkness from the prison house. In other words, they're imprisoned by their own false understandings and beliefs. Isaiah, or Yeshayahu 42 says, I, Yahuwah, have called you in righteousness, and I take hold of your hand and guard you and give you for a covenant to a people for a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am Yahuwah, that is my name, and my esteem I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. Now that's, uh, we're waiting for Yahusha. Now, 2 Corinthians 10 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings, and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. So his spirit is being poured out to all into men and women all over the earth. And receiving his spirit is actually receiving life. 
Mark uh, 16 says, later he appeared to the 11 as, he, as they sat at the table and he reproached their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he was raised. So he's resurrected at this point. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to every creature. And he who has believed and has been immersed shall be saved, but he who has not believed shall be condemned. And in Yahukin enter John chapter 20, it says, and having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the taught ones therefore rejoiced when they saw the master. Then Yahusha said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the, sp the set-apart spirit. Now, this is the uh, closing of the seminar, but I wanted to read this important psalm to you because this is something that you will have to face, and I want you to remember this on the day that you're dying. Okay? This is very important. Because the shadow of death is what this seminar is really about. And you have someone with you, okay? Yahuwah Roi is the first words in the, in the psalm. And it says, Yahuwah, my shepherd, is with us in the valley of the shadow of death. Psalm 23, verse 1 through 6. Yahuwah is my shepherd. I do not lack. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He turns back my being. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread before me a table in the face of my enemies, and you have anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Only goodness and kindness follow me in the, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of you to the length of days. That's so emotional for me. We need to remember that. Praise you. He's with us. Now, our commission is not serene. And it's our order to teach righteousness to the people who are lost and dying. <clears throat> Matthew 28 says, Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. And that's all I have. Teach them the name in the Torah. Praise Yahuwah. Baruch haba Shem Yahuwah. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahuwah.